Hello, this is Dr. Mitchell Carr from New York Medical College. Welcome to this educational activity on venoocclusive disease, also known as sinusoidal obstructive syndrome, where we will explore recent publications that point to a growing need for a greater consensus on disease recognition and management. Joining me in this discussion is Dr. Kenneth Cook from Johns Hopkins University. Ken, welcome. Mitch, always a pleasure. Thanks very much for having me here. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. The following audio is part of a certified educational activity titled Journal Insights on VODSOS, Expert Views on New Evidence and Guidelines for Disease Management. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at www.peerview.com forward slash KZZ. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Okay, so let's get started. VOD is a relatively rare complication, usually following hematopoietic cell transplantation or for purposes of this discussion, bone marrow transplantation, with an approximate incidence of 10 to 15% after allogeneic transplantation following myeloablative conditioning therapy. The incidence is somewhat lower after autologous transplantation as well as after reduced intensity or reduced toxicity conditioning and allotransplant, probably in the range of less than 5%. However, there seems to be a somewhat higher prevalence in very young and very old patients. Despite its rarity, VOD remains a very serious complication for patients undergoing bone marrow transplantation, one that should not be overlooked. Ken, let's talk about the mental impact of VOD, particularly in cases where patients also experience multi-organ dysfunction. Certainly, Mitch. I think this is actually a very important point. As you nicely outlined, the incidence of VOD is relatively low, thankfully. But what is most striking is the outcomes that associate with more severe VOD. So veno-occlusive disease, once the diagnosis is made, can be seen as mild, moderate, or more severe when associated with organ dysfunction, including the, uh, the lungs and the kidneys. The moderate and mild forms of the disease may very well respond and resolve spontaneously uh, with supportive care, but it is the severe manifestations of veno-occlusive disease, those that generally associate with either kidney or pulmonary dysfunction that really are associated with unacceptably high mortality rates. In fact, they can be as high as 80 to 90 percent in some uh, reports, and that really underscores a need for correct diagnosis and uh, rapid intervention when necessary. Thank you, Ken. There's clearly a need to develop sound approaches to diagnosing and management VOD in transplant patients. At the same time, we know there have been historically been challenges in diagnosis and treatment with the only approval of a drug most recently to treat VOD occurring in 2016. Ken, what can you tell us about the diagnosis? What have been the traditional criteria that have been used to make the diagnosis of VOD? Terrific question, Mitch. Again, in order to uh, intervene, you have to make the proper diagnosis. And there have been two diagnostic criteria that have been used over the last 30 years. Interestingly enough, both of these criteria, the Baltimore criteria and the modified Seattle criteria, were actually developed in the late 1980s. We'll talk a little bit about each one. We'll start with the Baltimore criteria, mainly because it's a bit more stringent. In order to make the diagnosis of VOD using the Baltimore criteria, signs and symptoms of disease have to happen within 21 days of transplant, and you have to have an elevated bilirubin, hyperbilirubinemia. Once that occurs, you need two of uh, three additional uh, findings. You can have hepatomegaly, an enlarged liver, ascites, or weight gain, which has to be greater than 5% from baseline. By contrast, the modified Seattle criteria is a little less stringent. Uh, you need to have two of three criteria, one of which is high bilirubin or elevated uh, bilirubin, but you don't have to have that per se. Uh, 
If you don't have hyperbilirubinemia, then you need to have hepatomegaly or right upper quadrant pain and also weight gain from baseline. But in this case, weight gain is only 2% from baseline. So again, the modified Seattle criteria are a little less stringent than the Baltimore criteria. And as you might expect, that can impact the overall incidence of veno-occlusive disease in any given report depending upon what criteria you use. Now, while these criteria have uh, stood the test of time, they do have some limitations. Firstly, they don't really account for late-onset veno-occlusive disease. Both of the criteria basically mandate that the signs and symptoms of disease have to happen within the first 20 to 21 days. And we know many times patients, particularly pediatric patients, can have VOD at later times. In addition, they're not very specific. So I think the time is right to potentially modify some of the diagnostic criteria in order to be more uh, specific with our diagnosis of VOD, and that would then allow us, uh, when necessary, to intervene accordingly. Thank you very much, Ken. What we've seen is that there is a need to come to grips with the seriousness of more severe manifestations of VOD, but also the varying ways that this disorder can manifest in the post bone marrow transplant setting. Next, we'll take a look at a few recent publications that represent first steps in the process of achieving a more modern consensus of the diagnosis of VOD and VOD management, one that includes insights from recent developments in the field. Recently, our colleagues in Europe have proposed revisions to the longstanding diagnostic criteria for VOD in adults as well as a new system for grading disease severity. While these recent proposals are a salutary first step in the right direction, more work certainly needs to be done, as we shall see. What I'd like to do now is review certain aspects of this publication, starting off with the author's take on the risk factors for VOD. Ken, what do you think about the risk factors listed here? How do they compare with what we've used historically in this setting? Thanks, Mitch. I think the risk factors as listed uh, are actually right in line with the ones that we have traditionally used. You can look at them as either being uh, two uh, or three categories of risk factors. I like to think of them as two, transplant-related risk factors and patient or disease-related risk factors. And within patient-related risk factors, of course, there is whether or not the liver has been uh, previously involved with inflammation or injury. So let's start with transplant-related risk factors. So firstly, we do know that the type of donor, an unrelated donor, for example, versus a related donor in an allogeneic setting can increase the risk for veno-occlusive disease. The match of the donor, whether or not it's full uh, or incomplete, whether or not there are T-cells that are infused in the bone marrow versus T-cell depleted, all of these are going to be part of the transplant-related risk factors. In addition, and perhaps most importantly, is the intensity of the conditioning regimen with myeloablative conditioning regimen certainly having a higher risk for VOD than reduced intensity or reduced toxicity. Uh, conditioning regimens. In addition, if you happen to use busulfan-based conditioning or total body irradiation at high doses, those too can lead to increased risks. And finally, and as one might suggest, if you have a second transplant, that too increases the risk. Then we can think about patient-related risk factors. So what is the age of the patient? As you mentioned, generally speaking, very old patients and some younger patients and infants can actually have a higher risk of VOD. A Karnofsky score, uh, underlying diagnosis, whether or not you have a metabolic syndrome of some sort in some of our pediatric patients, or solid tumors like neuroblastoma. Advanced disease or diseases that predispose to iron overload, particularly if it involves the liver, can also increase the risk of veno-occlusive disease. Within these patient-related risk factors are going to be any problems with the liver that can predate the transplant. For example, if your uh, liver enzymes are elevated, if your bilirubin is already elevated prior to transplant, that will increase your risk. If you have any kind of infection, a viral uh, hepatitis, for example, or if you had previous malignancy in the liver, that too can all increase your risk. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, transfusional iron overload, particularly if it involves the liver, is also associated with an increased risk of veno-occlusive disease. So Ken, what about the use of some of these new antibody conjugates? How do they play a role in the risk factor of patients 
developing VOD if they've received these antibody conjugates prior to going to transplantation? Great question, Mitch, and I'm sorry I did not include that earlier. Uh, but yes, uh, traditionally, gemtuzumab has been included as a uh, risk factor for the development of venoocclusive disease. As you know, actually, gemtuzumab in and of itself has sometimes been associated with venoocclusive disease even outside of the transplant setting. And then finally, a newer agent, uh, inotuzumab, is also going to be one of uh, these classes of drugs that can impact the liver and will increase the risk of venoocclusive disease after transplantation. That was superb. The authors have also proposed modifying the current diagnostic criteria in order to capture atypical presentations, including, for example, as you discussed earlier, late onset disease. Ken, what do you make of these proposed new criteria? Are they useful for the clinician? Are there presentations that would be difficult to capture even with these revisions? Excellent question, Mitch, and I think our colleagues in the uh, European BMT community have really taken uh, some uh, significant steps forward. So the new eBMT criteria for VOD diagnosis, at least in adults, is essentially based on the Baltimore criteria, where you need to have a uh, bilirubin that's elevated, generally greater than two milligrams per deciliter, and one of the two following criteria that need to be met, painful hepatomegaly, weight gain, again, greater than 5% from baseline, and the presence uh, of ascites. They also consider late onset VOD. So if these signs and symptoms occur beyond day 21, and you are still meeting classical definitions, then that too would count for late onset VOD. They also include histopathologic diagnoses. So if you're able to get a piece of liver tissue, perhaps via a transjugular biopsy, that can also cinch the diagnosis for venoocclusive disease. Finally, if you're beyond day 21, you have to have two or more of the following criteria must be met, hyperbilirubinemia, painful hepatomegaly, weight gain greater than 5%, or ascites. Again, these are the basic criteria that come from the uh, initial Baltimore criteria, just now extended beyond day 21. So I do think they have some merit, and I think they will allow us to capture late onset VOD when we might not have otherwise done that in the past. Would you also comment on their uh, now mention of use of ultrasound, particularly in the patients beyond 21 days, as another potential uh, diagnostic criteria. Excellent point, Mitch, and one that I failed to include, but that's right. They're also at least considering the inclusion of hemodynamical or other uh, ultrasound findings that would be supportive of VOD. Uh, and this is something that we uh, tend to uh, look for uh, when making the diagnosis, but heretofore, uh, they have not been included in the formal diagnostic criteria. Let's turn to another aspect of the guideline, severity grading. The authors rightly noted that a scoring system for VOD severity is lacking, but that such a model, if developed, could be used to identify patients requiring early therapeutic intervention. Ken, what's your take on this proposed system? So this is another great uh, point, Mitch. The EBMT is attempting to come up with some grading system where they actually use a handful of parameters, including uh, the time since first clinical symptoms, time post-transplant, is it early, is it late, uh, the overall level of bilirubin, the bilirubin kinetics, so how quickly is the bilirubin going up? What about uh, also increases in transaminases? Not something that is usually used to make the diagnosis, but they are including this in overall severity. They also consider increase in weight from baseline and also the presence or absence of renal dysfunction. Now, what they then do is look at different categories, mild, moderate, severe, and what they call very severe. And it's only the very severe form that they suggest would include multi-organ dysfunction, or multi-organ failure. And remember, that is when VOD is associated with unacceptably high mortality rates. The problem for me in this grading system is what happens if you cross columns, right? So what happens if you have early onset, but your weight is not up very high, your bilirubin is uh, maybe just above two, but your transaminases are very elevated. How do you piece that together if you are crossing columns from mild, moderate, severe, and very severe? Uh, also, the question is, uh, how important would this be? At least in the U.S., we know that the therapy that would best treat VOD with multi-organ dysfunction, defibrotide, is 
uh, really directly related to whether or not you have VOD with or without renal or kidney or pulmonary dysfunction. So I'm not sure how the grading actually would come into play. Finally, one of the things that we might consider if you want to stick with those criteria that we talked about earlier, time of onset, height of bilirubin, elevation of liver enzymes, weight increases in renal function, is perhaps to have a scoring system where for a given parameter, given the height of bilirubin, you might get a score, zero, one, two, or three, and then maybe a summation score could help get around the issue of crossing through these uh, particular categories of mild, moderate, and severe. One thing we may consider moving forward. Those are excellent points. Thanks, Ken. However, would a simplified model that stratified severity into VOD with multi-organ dysfunction or VOD without multi-organ dysfunction be more useful? As I was uh, alluding to, I think that would be the case, particularly here in the U.S., where that is a defining point as to whether or not we would treat VOD just with supportive care or maybe consider other medicinal treatments like the use of defibrotide. Ken. Are there any candidate surrogate markers that might be used to suggest the presence of VOD with or without uh, multi-organ dysfunction? Yes, indeed. I think there are many relatively straightforward clinical surrogates. For example, when considering uh, renal or kidney dysfunction, we could look at serum creatinine, for example. And if serum creatinine is rising from baseline, that is a surrogate marker for renal dysfunction. That would then associate with decreased creatinine clearance or glomerular filtration rate uh, or urine output. So if you have decreased urine output, decreased creatinine clearance, and an increased serum creatinine, all of those would be surrogates for kidney or renal dysfunction. Along the same lines, when we think about clinical findings for pulmonary dysfunction, we can think of several. Firstly, does a patient need supplemental oxygen? That could be delivered by face mask or nasal cannula. Uh, is there increased work of breathing or perhaps dyspnea on exertion? This would suggest that there is evidence for underlying respiratory or pulmonary dysfunction. Finally, are there radiographic changes? Are there infiltrates or effusions on x-ray or CAT scan? Uh, that too would also uh, signal that something is going on in the lungs. And of course, in the worst case scenario, the need for dialysis or for ventilatory support, whether that be invasive or non-invasive, are clear indicators of either renal or pulmonary dysfunction. So those clinical surrogates, I still think, uh, will play a role in determining whether or not patients are developing organ dysfunction. Those are superb points, thank you. We've seen what our colleagues in Europe developed in an attempt to address the challenges of VOD in adults. Stay tuned in the next segment where we're going to turn our attention to pediatric patients. Welcome back. We're going to now look at another publication by European investigators on the diagnosis and severity criteria for VOD, however, this time in pediatric patients. In this paper, the authors attempt to assess differences in VOD or SOS between adult and pediatric populations. Here you can note the authors' differences in a number of areas between adult and pediatric patients, including incidence, risk factors, and clinical presentation. Now, I find, uh, Ken, some interesting uh, uh, notes on this a new uh, uh, paper, and uh, let me cover a couple of them and see what your take is. Sure. <clears throat> so first, the authors note that in high-risk patients, the incidence of VOD can be up to 60%. Uh, I'm not sure which high-risk patients they might be referring to. 60% is certainly a very high figure. A uh, second area that um, I have some questions about is they say the risk of anecteric or uh, Non-elevated bilirubin may be as high as 30% in the pediatric population. I'd be interested in your um, understanding of that. And I think one of the most important positive findings they have in this paper is that the uh, Europeans have demonstrated the efficacy of defibrotide as a prevention measure in SOS in children that hasn't been performed yet in adults. Your thoughts on these? Yeah, excellent point. Uh, Mitch. In, in fact, this is a, uh, an important paper as well. They do uh, bring out a couple of 
Uh, interesting notes. To start with your first, this higher incidence, really up to 60% in certain pediatric patients. Uh, that has not been my personal experience, but I'm wondering if they're focusing primarily on patients with osteopetrosis, um, HLH, uh, or other metabolic disorders, which we don't get a chance to see too often in the U.S., but I think that is where your highest uh, incidence of VOD is going to be. If it is up to 60%, that is beyond uh, my own uh, personal experience, uh, but we can check and see if that is supported by the literature. In addition, they do mention anecteric VOD. Now, this is a big issue, particularly in kids. The incidence is high as 30%. Uh, that, again, seems to be a little more than I'm used to seeing in my own personal experience. However, it is important to note that there are pediatric patients who can develop the full spectrum of VOD signs and symptoms still having a bilirubin less than two. So I think those are two very important points. And... Um the data showing that uh, defibrotide was efficacious in preventing VOD in children uh, yet to be proven in adults um, in Europe, yet we don't have an indication for that in the U.S. That is correct. Uh, I think that was a very uh, nicely done uh, study, again, targeting, as I understand, high-risk pediatric patients. So those patients with neuroblastoma, osteopetrosis, other metabolic disorders, or HLH. Uh, and in that study, uh, they demonstrated that the use of defibrotide as a prophylactic agent could actually reduce the incidence of veno-occlusive disease. The authors have also proposed revising diagnostic criteria similar to what we've seen proposed for adults. What is your understanding about the new EBMT diagnostic criteria for VOD in children? So this was another step, I think, in the right direction. So the first thing they did is they tore down any type of time limitation. So they really left that uh, uh, as uh, an, an open uh, criteria. You no longer have to be within 20 days. And I think that is important, of course, to pick up late onset VOD. They also kind of extend the number of parameters that you can consider and still only require two. Uh, so, for example, they include... Um, thrombocytopenia that is otherwise refractory to platelet transfusions. That is not something that we have generally considered. Sometimes we see that in patients with VOD, but this would not be a very uh, specific finding, but something we could also consider. The diagnostic criteria that they did put forth, however, did not include two relatively important things, I believe. Firstly, they do not comment on whether or not uh, the histopathologic diagnosis of veno-occlusive disease on liver pathology uh, would actually allow you to make the diagnosis. One would believe that it would. We generally don't get liver biopsies too often in our pediatric patients, but in a late-onset patient, perhaps a laparoscopic liver biopsy would be indicated, and that could change management if we made the, uh, the correct diagnosis. And finally, I don't believe those criteria include consideration for uh, ultrasound findings, whether that be uh, helping to augment our ability to demonstrate an enlarged liver or ascites or actually any comments on reversal of flow. So those are two things that we could potentially consider if we wanted to modify those diagnostic considerations further. One thing to keep in mind though, Mitch, as we both know, if you're only looking for two criteria and you increase the number of potential criteria you can choose from, that is going to increase the incidence, but probably also decrease the sensitivity and specificity of those diagnostic uh, panel. Ken, how would these new criteria compare with the old Baltimore and modified Seattle criteria? So great question. I think the big issue is that they do uh, consider both late onset and anecteric VOD. Now, the modified Seattle criteria, as we know, does kind of take that into consideration as well because it is not an absolute finding, but it could be one of the three parameters uh, that would otherwise uh, get you to the diagnosis of VOD. Similar to the paper in adults, the author has also proposed a revised system for grading VOD severity. While interesting as with the prior attempt to update a severity scoring system, it is likely that a simplified system will be more clinically useful. Ken, what is your take on this new system that they have proposed? Well, Mitch, I couldn't agree with you more. Again, the new system proposed by Dr. Gorbachurlu and colleagues uh, includes a number of parameters, as we were talking about before. Uh, that does include uh, liver enzyme elevation, uh, total elevation of bilirubin. 
the presence or absence of coagulation dysfunction, uh, the presence or absence of renal dysfunction, and also the presence or absence of pulmonary dysfunction. So we have a list of parameters that again can be graded mild, moderate, severe, or very severe. Uh, again, in this particular case, uh, the investigators really include multi-organ dysfunction or failure only in the very severe diseases. I think the limitations get back to what we were discussing before. What if you have a relatively low bilirubin but very high LFTs, uh, and uh, what if you ultimately have um, uh, early onset? So where is that going to fall? Is that going to be mild? Is it going to be moderate? Is it going to be severe? You're kind of picking. Uh, levels of severity from the different columns. So I think there's some drawbacks there. Again, maybe one way to get around this is to come up with a point system where you get a certain number uh, of points if you have early onset disease, for example, versus late. Uh, maybe you get a certain number of points if your LFTs are normal or if they're very high. And then you can sum those points together and perhaps kind of break out uh, different uh, grades of veno-occlusive disease. Lastly, would you comment on the inconsistency in this uh, grading severity where the investigators list uh, renal dysfunction and pulmonary dysfunction in a moderate category, but later refer to the uh, multi-organ dysfunction only in the very severe? That's a great point, Mitch. So in this table, uh, you can actually have moderately severe veno-occlusive disease, but still be on greater than two uh, liters of oxygen, or have a creatinine that may have increased uh, or doubled over the course of time. And we know here in the United States, in that context, that would give you veno-occlusive disease with either pulmonary or renal dysfunction, and that would place us in a, uh, a situation where outcomes we know are unacceptably poor. Getting back to your point is what is the clinical relevance of this? At least in the United States, our approach to veno-occlusive disease is going to be whether or not it is associated with organ dysfunction. If it is not, then our approach would be supportive care. If it is associated with renal or pulmonary dysfunction, then we can consider medicinal agents like defibrotide. And then finally, I would say if there was some uh, way that these particular criteria or these um, uh, grading scores uh, could actually predict for worsening or predict for outcome, there might be some merit there, but I'm not sure that there's evidence-based uh, information to support that at this point. In the final part of this discussion, we'll take a look at the current treatment options for VOD. Recent evidence published in this area and share a few case scenarios that will illustrate some of the advances we've made, but also some of the challenges we still face when managing our patients. So let's review the current options for VOD management. So currently, the FDA has approved the use of defibrotide in adult and pediatric patients with hepatic VOD or SOS with either renal or pulmonary dysfunction following transplant. And for those patients who don't have evidence of multi-organ dysfunction, just supportive care is generally recommended, including diuresis, hemofiltration, fluid restriction, salt restriction, et cetera. Recently, it's become clear that the use of supportive care plus defibrotide is associated with improved outcomes in patients with VOD and multi-organ dysfunction. The most recently published data in this area include a phase three trial as well experienced from a treatment IND study. Ken, what is your take on the main findings of the phase three paper recently published by Richardson and colleagues? Yes, thanks, Mitch. As we know, this was an interesting phase three study in that the controls were historical rather than a randomized phase three trial, which has been heretofore uh, a very challenging study to come up with. So this was uh, nonetheless a pivotal trial, and I think a couple of points uh, require notation. Firstly, there was about 100 patients that were enrolled in the defibrotide arm, and there was approximately 30 or 32 patients that were included in the historical controls. And some of the take-homes are um, exemplified in the table here. So firstly, the survival at day 100 in the defibrotide arm was 38%, 38.2, whereas the survival in historical controls not treated with defibrotide was 25%, and that was significant at the P equals 0.01 level. 
That went on to uh, associate with a complete response at day 100 that was higher in the defibrotide arm, 25% versus 12.5% in the historical control arm. Importantly, despite this improvement in uh, complete response and day 100 survival, uh, the adverse events, including hemorrhagic events of any grade, were really similar between the two groups. And I think that was an important take-home point from this paper. We've also now seen the published evidence from the treatment IND study, which was the largest prospective study with approximately 573 patients who received defibrotide for the treatment of VOD or SOS with or without multi-organ dysfunction post-transplant or chemotherapy. Ken, take us through the main findings of this new treatment IND study. Happy to, Mitch. Again, a couple of important points, the first of which is the strength of the overall numbers. The total uh, overall population was 573, with approximately 350 or 351 uh, having um, uh, multi-organ dysfunction associated with their VOD, and the remaining, approximately 222, not having multi-organ dysfunction. In either subgroup, it turned out that patients who received defibrotide actually uh, fared pretty well. So, for example, of the 351 patients who had VOD with multi-organ dysfunction, 159, or about 43% of those patients were alive at the end of the uh, study observation period. Similarly, in patients who had VOD without multi-organ dysfunction, about 58% of those patients uh, were alive. So again, this was, I think, a, an important uh, advance in the ability to treat patients with or without multi-organ dysfunction. We also have had some practical insight from the treatment IND study on the timing of defibrotide initiation. In this study, defibrotide was started on the day of the diagnosis in only approximately 30% of patients and within seven days uh, 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 of onset in greater than 90% of patients. We saw a significant superior day 100 survival rate when treatment was initiated closer to the diagnosis of VOD. What is your take on these findings? I think these are also very exciting findings. This was a post hoc analysis, as I understand, from the uh, IND study, uh, and again underscores the importance of making a correct diagnosis and trying to get an agent like defibrotide on board sooner than later. I think that is generally the practice that we have adopted at Johns Hopkins. Uh, we really want to have uh, uh, close vigilance of all of our patients, who, particularly those who are at high risk. Once we make the diagnosis, we are on high alert for looking for those correlates of either pulmonary or renal dysfunction, and when they are noted, uh, we like to start defibrotide as soon as we can. Before we close, let's review two cases. One is a pediatric patient with neuroblastoma, the other an adult with AML. Both patients will be discussing received stem cell transplants as part of their therapy. Ken, let's take a look at Terry's case, which illustrates some of the issues we've been discussing. So Terry is a two-year-old girl with neuroblastoma who responded well to her initial induction therapy. She then was ready to be admitted for an autologous stem cell transplant. She received a myeloablative conditioning regimen with busulfan and melphalon and had an autologous stem cell transplant and it had an unremarkable course and was discharged early at approximately 21 days. However, on day 32, this patient returned to the clinic with significant ascites, hepatomegaly, some respiratory distress requiring two liters of oxygen, and 12% weight gain. However, her bilirubin was low, only at about one milligram per deciliter. Her ultrasound, however, at that time did show reversal of flow. She was admitted to the hospital, and because she had VOD and evidence of multi-organ dysfunction, she received supportive care along with defibrotide at the standard dose of 25 milligram per kilo per day. Her symptoms improved within a week, and fortunately, she had resolution of all symptoms after a three-week cycle or 21 days of defibrotide. Ken, what are your thoughts about this case uh, that I just described about Terry and some of the issues we've been discussing this morning? This is a great case, Mitch, right? And it really underscores some of the nuances we see in pediatric patients. Firstly, late onset VOD. 
patient comes in, gets a busulfan melphalan conditioning, does relatively well, and gets out within three weeks, but then comes back within approximately 10 days with classic signs and symptoms of veno-occlusive disease. So it does take in consideration this late onset uh, form of the disease, which we do see with some frequency. In addition, it also highlights uh, the incidence of anecteric VOD, right? Here's a patient who gained weight. She was at high risk. She gained a significant amount of weight. She had hepatomegaly. She had reversal of flow on ultrasound. All of those things add up, but yet her bilirubin is still well within the normal limit. So I think this really underscores uh, perfectly those two nuances in pediatric VOD. The patient then appropriately gets started on defibrotide treatment because she had VOD with evidence of organ dysfunction, in this case respiratory, and thankfully she has uh, a, a complete response to therapy. So this is really a, a terrific case. Here's another case. This is Sharon. She's a 47-year-old woman with AML who received a seven and three induction and an Ida Rubison consolidation and obtained a complete remission. She had a matched unrelated donor available and so she went to transplant with classical busulfan and cyclophosphamide conditioning and received GVHD prophylaxis with serolimus and tacrolimus. However, on day 15, she had evidence of approximately a 10% weight gain and her bilirubin started to go up the next day and was up to approximately 3.5 milligram per <coughs> deciliter. And her creatinine began to rise and was 1.6 times the baseline at transplant. And she also demonstrated reversal of flow on the Doppler. And therefore, she was diagnosed as having severe VOD and multi-organ dysfunction because of her renal insufficiency. She started on supportive care and started on defibrotide the very next day. Again, I think an excellent case that underscores a couple of important things. So firstly, we know that in adults, the incidence of VOD uh, reportedly is lower than it is in pediatrics. However, it is important for adult colleagues to know that it can happen and you need to make an accurate diagnosis in order to potentially uh, make the uh, available therapies that are now FDA approved uh, um, uh, open to those patients. So it also underscores a couple of risk factors, right? Unrelated donor transplant, as we discussed before, that increases your risk of veno-occlusive disease. She happened to have AML, so she had cycles of uh, pretty intense therapy that may very well have inflamed her liver. So all of those things were gonna put her at increased risk. The diagnosis is made uh, at this point uh, really by a standard Baltimore criteria. It's well within the initial accepted age range, uh, excuse me, um, uh, time post-transplant. Uh, in addition, as you point out, she has increase in her serum creatinine. That underscores the importance of uh, organ dysfunction, in this case, renal or uh, kidney, and that then allows for the appropriate use of defibrotide in this patient, uh, and hopefully she too uh, would end up having a positive response. But again, underscoring the importance of knowing that this can occur in the adult population, particularly when patients are getting a myeloablative prep, and in this case, an unrelated donor transplant. Uh, so um, yeah, I think we need to keep our eyes and ears open both in pediatrics uh, and in high-risk adult patients. I think what we've seen today is that there is still some incremental progress being made in standardizing approaches for the diagnosis of VOD so that atypical or more challenging presentations can be recognized. However, more work needs to be done, particularly in the areas such as severity grading where a simplified definition that accurately addresses the presence or absence of multi-organ dysfunction may be useful. There is also clear progress being made in treatment where we now have an approved effective option in defibrotide for use in conjunction with long-standing supportive care strategies. Ken, I want to thank you for joining us today in this discussion. Mitch, it's always a pleasure. I really enjoy discussing the challenges that are associated with making the diagnosis of veno-occlusive disease and, of course, the challenges with successful treatment. So thank you for having me. And I want to thank you for watching. I hope you find this program useful for your practice. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at www.peerview.com forward slash kzz. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Jazz Pharmaceuticals Incorporated.
This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute, Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.